All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm gonna give it one more minute here just to allow other attendees to continue logging in. Okay, so um, welcome everyone. I'm Haley Boyle, Vice President of Programs at the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia. We're a nonpartisan international affairs experience provider with more than 70 years of expertise in connecting Philadelphia to the world. And as so many of you know, we're dedicated to creating fresh, nonpartisan civil discourse on critical issues affecting the world today. I'd like to offer a special welcome to some of the high school students, college students, and teachers who participate in the Council's education programs throughout the year. As the leading provider of foreign affairs and international education across our region, the Council works with over 2,500 students and 85 schools every year. These students are not just the leaders of our future, but they are the leaders of today. And this afternoon, we'll get the opportunity to hear from one of these students when we kick off our audience Q&A. Of course, don't be shy about sharing your experience and screenshots from this event with us on social media. You can use the hashtag WACPHL, that's W-A-C-P-H-L, and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Twitter for updates and happenings from the Council. Today, we are delighted to welcome Professor Wajma Osman. Wajma is an Afghan-American academic and filmmaker. She is an assistant professor in media studies and production at Temple University. In her book, Television and the Afghan Culture Wars, brought to you by foreigners, warlords, and activists, she analyzes the impact of international funding and cross-border media flows on the national politics of Afghanistan, the region, and beyond. She is also the co-director of the critically acclaimed documentary, Postcards from Tora Bora, and she's the co-author of the forthcoming Afghanistan, a very short introduction from Oxford University Press. Her re research and teaching are rooted in feminist media ethnographies that focus on the political economy of global media industries and the regimes of representation and visual culture they produce. She has appeared as a commentator on Democracy Now!, WNYC, NPR, and Al Jazeera, and works with community and activist groups. We're really delighted to have Wishma with us today, and I'm certain that all of you have many questions for her, so we'll make sure that there's ample time for those questions after her opening remarks. Please remember to submit your questions at any time using the Q&A feature on your Zoom platform, and we'll make sure to get to as many of those as possible. Wajma, I'm going to pass the vi uh, virtual mic over to you, and I'll rejoin you on screen around 12.30 to help facilitate Q&A. Wonderful. Um, thank you, Haley, for uh, that great introduction. Um, and I wanted to also um, thank uh, Lauren Schwartz, as well as Haley again for inviting me to speak to you. Um, so the title of the talk is What Comes Next for Afghanistan and Its People. Um, in addition to that, I'm going to try to share some of the key takeaways from my uh, recently published book um, and then tie it into the question of where we're at now and, you know, how we got to this point and um, I, uh, I'm gonna keep it under um, a half an hour so that we have at least a half an hour because the whole program is about an hour for Q&A and I look forward to opening it up and um, discussing any of the aspects of my uh, presentation further. So let me go ahead and um, share my screen. So I'll, I'll start by... Um, talking a little bit about, um, you know, uh, you know, my, my positionality vis-a-vis -vis this topic is I'm an insider as well as an outsider, meaning I'm originally from Afghanistan and I came to the U.S. when I was 10 years old and I've made uh, many trips back, uh, particularly in the post 9-11 era. 
where it was uh, easier to make trips. So I've made numerous trips back, both because of um, filmmaking. I used to uh, be a journalist and I've uh, made a number of films, but also more recently for academic endeavors and for academic research. Um, yeah, and so right now, unfortunately, I was planning on making another um, trip at the end of the summer, but due to the Taliban takeover, many things are um, on hold until we see what happens due to the um, dire situation and circumstances over there. So um, I'll start by showing um, a clip of, of a documentary film that I co-directed and uh, produced with a few other people called Postcards from Tora Bora, I'll show you the trailer for it. Um, and this was made in 2007. And um, my book came out in 2020, so last year. Um, but I wanted to start by showing the trailer of the film because the film um, gives a little overview of um, what the impact of over 40 years of wars um, has been for um, Afghan people personally um, and politically. Um, so, um, this is my parents' wedding at the Intercontinental Hotel. Looking at my can you hear that? Parents captured on film, forever young, forever happy. Their future seemed bright. In a million years, they could not have imagined what was about to become of their lives their city, and their country. Afghanistan. That looks like my father when he was young. Sometimes it's better not to see what it used to be. So, um, yeah, I'd like to start with that just so, um, you know, I think uh, some people who um, study the region um, also don't have a personal connection. And when you see things from the inside and outside, it's a different type of experience. So um, back to uh, some of my more recent academic work, including the book, um, what I wanted to um, preface is that um, you know, oftentimes I'm asked, I've given some book talks, what drew me to write the book on media in Afghanistan. Um, and what I talk about, and the book is about media and the culture wars um, in Afghanistan, and I'll talk a little bit more about it. But what drew me to write it in the first place was that um, Afghanistan has been um, in the purview of influence or under different types of imperial rule for a long time, starting with, um, you know, earlier on with the great game. And then later on, we have the Cold War and the great game was uh, mostly uh, the British Empire and the Russian empires. Um, and so since um, British rule of Afghanistan, the pre prevailing image of Afghanistan and much of Western um, literature and news and so forth has been one that has uh, been produced in light of these um, imperial types of ambitions. And these images um, are stereotypical and have had uh, negative impacts on the communities that I'm a part of. Um, and, you know, some of the images include um, 
savages or people who are incapable of modernizing and changing. Um, and this, you know, are terms that have actually been used that people are backwards, um, including in the works of, um, of um, Rudyard Kipling and Winston Churchill and other people. Um, and so this is, this is not unique, this type of um, categorizing of people from um, the East and the Middle East uh, more precisely. Um, this is also the case with other people from that region. Um, but I knew from my own um, you know, background uh, as an Afghan American, as well as my um, academic training that Afghanistan actually um, has a vibrant culture and was progressing towards more modern and democratic forms of government, um, as well as uh, you know, becoming more cognizant of human rights and women's rights. And in particular, I remember my, um, as a child, my parents and my aunts and uncles were protesting uh, for these types of more democratic um, and human rights and women's rights um, uh, social movements um, in, in Kabul, which is where I was born. Um, and so um, that's what led me to go back and do research in the post 9-11 time period um, in Afghanistan was because I knew that there's a long history of cultural wars. And so, um, and this is a image of, um, of uh, uh, Chris Kyle, um, the film American Sniper is based on him. And in the film, he's shown as a very, um, you know, empathetic and morally um, conscientious type of individual, but in his memoir and other um, you know, interviews with him, he actually did not have a good image. And so much of the earlier colonial imagery and uh, literature has passed on in terms of, um, you know, the US's involvement in Afghanistan as well. And here is an image of me. Um, this, is, um, this is one of my first trips um, and my first research trips in Afghanistan. So uh, this was in the um, uh, 2010. And, um, you know, so I decided to go back because with, after 9-11 po after and the attacks on the World Trade Center and Pentagon and so forth, um, many of these um, images of Afghan people being affiliated with um, extremist Islam and so forth um, continued and they were, for, you know, people from that region were further stereotyped in um, the media and popular culture and films and so forth, documentaries here. Um, and so um, I knew that it was important for, for me to, um, with my book, to direct the dialogue back to local Afghans themselves. Um, and then you know, I wanted to ask questions such as what does human rights mean over there? Um, how do people conceptualize women's rights? What do terms like conservative, progressive, you know, uh, centrist mean in contemporary Afghanistan? Um, this, this was actually, an, I'm on a Chinook military helicopter. I went on a diplomatic um, mission. I was invited to join uh, Carl Eikenberry's team um, when they were going to um, one of the more um, rural areas in Afghanistan. Um, so that's what led to my book, um, Television and the Afghan Culture Wars, brought to you by foreigners, warlords, and, and activists. And this is the table of content of it, which, you know, of course, I don't um, expect anyone to read any of the fine print, but just to give you a little overview of uh, some of the topics that I discuss, and I'm going to go into some of the, as I said, highlights of the book briefly, and then we can um, talk a little bit more about uh, the implications of, of uh, my findings on where um, Afghanistan currently finds itself. Um, so, um, as I said, most of my research was in media. Um, 
And uh, over the last um, two decades before the Taliban takeover, what people are calling Taliban 2.0, um, Afghanistan experienced a surge in new media creation. There was dozens of broadcast television and radio stations, which are um, the most uh, you know, ubiquitous and powerful of the media institutions because most people are illiterate. But there was also some um, developing internet infrastructure and mobile telephone companies were set up and so forth. And sadly, I, you know, currently post Taliban takeover, most of the media that I studied has been um, shut down or um, are programming, but not at the same quantity and, and self-censoring themselves out of fear and so forth. Uh, and most of the funding for this, uh, you know, media pl proliferation that I studied came from the what, what we call the international donor community. And that includes the neighboring countries as well as Western uh, nations. And uh, I carried out over 100 formal interviews with high and low level media producers and government officials, as well as everyday people who, um, cross section of the population who were um, the viewers um, of, and audiences of these media. Um, so um, this slide has a good bit to unpack. On the left, what you see is a picture. Most of the pictures I took is a US soldier guarding what's called a telecom tower. And that's um, are usually built with uh, US money. And this one is USAID built. Um, and they are um, the ones that broadcast radio and television and internet and mobiles and so forth. And so um, it's an integral part, was an integral part of uh, the uh, communication. And so oftentimes it was protected from, uh, you know, what are called the insurgents. Um, and um, what I demonstrate in television and the Afghan culture wars is that the international um, communities interventions in Afghanistan resulted um, in uh, yielding some very positive development projects along with some problematic and misguided development projects as well and also imperialism in the form of, of war because under different administrations, the number of troops increased or decreased, whether it was um, the Bush administration first or the Ob Obama administration and then the Trump administration, because you know this is the longest US war now. Um, however, the aerial campaigns continue to be, as you can see in this statistic, uh, continue to increase. So dipped a little bit, um, in the 2010s over 2015, and then, you know, continue to uh, be relatively high in terms of the, uh, as I said, the aerial military campaigns. Um, and then the bottom chart that you see here is um, a funding chart from SIGAR, which is the Office of the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction. And that was, um, an agency that was mandated in 2008 by the US Congress to provide oversight of US reconstruction, um, reconstruction and development expenditures. Mind you that the US was one of the largest donors to development. And if you include military expenditures, the numbers range anywhere that we spent in the last um, 20 years from one, one trillion to three trillion dollars on the entire um, war development combo. Um, and so what cigar, uh, what cigar, uh, cigar's many reports and um, investigations revealed is that um, indeed the, some of the development projects, as I said, um, were very beneficial and yielded positive uh, results, but other ones um, were plagued by issues of uh, fraud and misappropriation of money. Um, and also there wasn't good oversight and sometimes Cigar couldn't even get the data that these um, um, agencies 
US funded or NGOs, non-governmental organizations and uh, governmental organizations were supposed to keep for their record keeping. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind with, uh, with this set of um, graphs and charts is that this is where we can also answer the big question that everybody's asking, which is um, how are the Taliban after, you know, you know, as I said, estimates range between $1 trillion to $3 trillion spent. Um, how are they able to come back? If the goal was to remove them and we temporarily remove them, how did they manage to take over the country so quickly after the U.S. withdrawal? And I think it's in these charts that we can get a glimpse of the answer to that. And, and that has to do mainly with the fact that um, that part of the developed money more and more was being um, used and misappropriated or misused. And so corruption was rapidly increasing uh, within um, the Afghan government. And oftentimes people call it the US backed Afghan government because the US was very involved with the elections and supporting some candidates and not other candidates. And then in addition to that, as I said, the the aerial bombing campaigns, including night raids and some, some of those things also created um, resentment and the Taliban were able to use this resentment against the US backed governments, corruption. So some people were becoming very wealthy, but the majority of people, it, you know, the aid did not reach them um, as well as the military campaigns where there was a, a rise in civilian casualties. So the Taliban capitalized on, on uh, people's resentment and hopelessness in that respect. And the other thing to keep in mind is that the conditions were much better in um, urban areas. And most of my research was in urban areas in particular in Kabul, the capital. But in rural areas, uh, you had even less aid um, reach those areas. And, and they were also outside of, of um, the international oversight. So there was less press there. And so there was many more um, types of nefarious things happening and more um, of the violence impacted those areas by the international military troops, as well as the Afghan government who are both together trying to fight the, um, what at the time they called the insurgents, but now are more specifically focusing on the Taliban. Um, so yeah, that's why I spend a little bit more time on that. So back to, um, you know, in the book, I also introduce my two concepts of uh, what I call um, the development gaze and the imperial gaze um, in order to understand the complexities of the merger between development and war. Um, and indeed, there are two sides of the same coin. Um, and oftentimes, the, you know, what I call the imperial gaze or imperialist agendas undermine the altruism and the good intentions um, of development projects that genuinely want to uh, make a positive you know, impact on nation building and human rights and so forth. Um, but I also think it's important to differentiate between the two and not to, even though there's overlap, um, it's important to realize that, that you know, there have been many good development projects, which I talk about in my book that are funded directly by um, the US government. Um, and that those projects tend to be much more um, participatory, meaning, you know, they are collaborative with local populations and they're more grounds up as opposed to uh, more top down. So, um, Moving into some of the media analysis, these are some of the popular genres um, on Afghan television. Uh, so some of them were produced with, uh, you know, good, most of the TV stations that um, I interviewed receive money from the US and some of them don't. And some of them uh, are more expensive to produce and less so. Um, I can't go into all of these. I think we're running low on time, but I'll just um, talk about a few 
these are dramatic serials from, you know, there's dramatic serials from around the world. The Indian ones tend to be very popular. On the bottom, you see, this is one of the Afghan original dramatic serials that became very popular um, in 2018, um, it emerged. The first few ones uh, were not on par with the Turkish, Iranian, and Indian ones that were um, much better produced and you know they have a longer history of, of media development. Um, this is uh, some of the um, what what are um, uh, the villainous characters on the serials who some of the women audiences tend to find empowering um, due to the fact that oftentimes some of the other programming they found to be very didactic about women's rights and they found these to be um, a little bit more liberating. Um, and then on the bottom right is you have Sabah Sahar who is a, a police captain and also a filmmaker. She's made numerous films and has um, is very popular and she was the target of a um, uh, assassination attempt um, last year, but luckily she survived. Um, so reality TV is another popular genres, and these are mostly uh, supported by Western media corporations. So this is um, Afghan Star, which of course is not running during the Taliban. There's not a new season. The Taliban uh, is neither a fan of um, dramatic serials, especially foreign ones, or um, Afghan Star. Um, but these, um, you know, these shows oftentimes try to equate, um, you know, um, you know, voting for your favorite contestants with choosing elected officials, and they're very different things. So this is something I talk about in the book that um, that there's aspects of of reality TV programs that um, are emancipatory, but they they can't be seen as um, as entirely democratizing. Um, so the last category is what I call the news, um, you know, public information campaigns or PICs, political satire and talk shows. And there was numerous ones that were launched. And these, I, th I think, were some of the most um, important of the media developments. Um, and um, they're very popular with viewers and not very high cost. And I argue that after experiencing four decades of war and trauma, Afghan audiences have a very high expectation of media and journalism in general. And these um, shows manage to deliver on that. Um, the audiences want the media to bring justice and retribution to uh, warlords um, and other um, elites who are sowing the seeds of war, gender violence, as well as ethnic and sectarian strife. And with these programs, such as public service announcements, the news, political satire, media makers uncover, investigate, and expose corruption, abuses of power, and violence by warlords and government officials. Um, of course, you know, all of these programs are in jeopardy currently as well, and most of them are not running in the same capacity. And just briefly, I can't go into all of them, but this, this one is about women's rights. It's a program called Niqab or the mask, and they give women a mask in order to protect their um, identity and make them anonymous so that they can share um, stories of misogyny and uh, whether it's domestic inside their homes or more broadly by um, Islamists and positions of power. And then this is my last slide. Um, so my conclusion is that um, the Afghan media was actually delivering and meeting the high demands and needs of Afghans. Um, and without a doubt that the power of protests and broadcast media was a very effective social tool for collective action in Afghanistan. Um, yet there was and still is a huge cost to the, this emergence of a public sphere violence against media makers um, was a big problem back then. And now um, the Taliban has continued to censor um, the media and target journalists. Um, 
And um, as the only counterbalance to government warlords and foreign interests in Afghanistan, the media um, was and still is the only hope for providing a semblance of justice, debate, and healing, including not just for Afghans over there, but we can also think about, you know, there's less access to international correspondence. So the coverage that we received here has also been impacted and limited um, in disinformation sometimes spreads um, between what I hear in the media and what my um, sources on the ground say. Um, and so, you know, I think it's doubly important right now for the international community to put pressure on the Taliban to, um, you know, maintain um, women's rights, freedom of speech, human rights, um, you know, the rights of ethnic minorities and so forth. And um, I think we're, we are in that position that we can do that because um, currently um, the U.S. Um, and um, the EU are withholding funds that were allocated to Afghans. And um, according to estimates, about 70% of the GDP of Afghanistan is reliant, including uh, salaries of government um, and civil servants. And so, um, you know, these are ways that we could put pressure on them to hopefully uh, form a more um, inclusive government as well as some kind of transitional government until there can be elections again, because everyone I've talked to, um, you know, regardless of, you know, their stance and um, whether they, um, like the Taliban or not like the Taliban, the, nobody wants a government that came into power um, by force. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Wajma. So we're, um, we're gonna start our Q&A with our audience and, and I'd first like to introduce um, our senior student from Cristo Rey Philadelphia High School, Asada Ba. And Asada is also a work study student at the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia currently. So Asada, welcome and um, feel free to ask your question. Thank you for that introduction. So um, in relation to the recent events in Afghanistan that's created an intense global shock, we can only imagine how the Afghan citizens may feel under the Taliban's regime. Luckily, we have current day media such as your documentaries that's able to shed light on these current events and spark worldwide conversation in regard to protecting the human rights of Afghans. That being said, do you think that the media has done a good job of uncovering the explicit truths of the trauma that stemmed from the situation? Or do you think that there's some bias linked to their visual representation? Thank you, Asada. That's a um, great question. And I myself, you know, when I was going through undergrad, was a work study student myself. So I know it's a good experience. Um, as uh, for your question, you know, that's what I alluded to at the end. I think, um, I think, you know, the Taliban has not only impacted the lives and media coverage uh, of, for people in Afghanistan, but also here because um, before you had many more um, international correspondents being able to go in and out and also many of the Afghan journalists and um, Afghan reporters and media makers um, have left or are trying to leave, right, during the evacuations. And, and the international correspondents oftentimes rely on the local media makers because they tend to, I mean, some of them have the language skills, but not all of them do. So they employ them as fixers and so forth. And so um, I think it has, it has caused a level of disinformation and bias because there's less people on the ground there. Um, and so uh, we have less reliable accounts. Um, the Taliban have been very good to some, um, some um, American journalists, in particular to some, some uh, women, um, American women 
uh, journalists and the CNN journalist, I'm forgetting her name, and others, um, because they want to make a show of the fact that it's still safe for women and they're upholding women's rights. But at the same time, there I know um, journalists on the ground there who are being persecuted, I should say, in various ways. Um, on the other hand, in, uh, in some other locations, they are still allowing women's um, and girls' education to continue. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a complicated situation. We can't say that they've entirely curtailed all the developments, but in certain ways they have uh, caused a great deal of damage. In other ways, things are allowed to go on a little bit more. That makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Asada. All right, so we have a couple questions that have come in and um, I'll just remind folks in the audience, if you do have questions, feel free to use the Q&A function on your Zoom platform and, and we'll be sure to get to as many of those as possible. Um, so Wajma, kind of in follow-up to um, Asada's question, um, we have one that came in from um, an audience member, uh, Georgia Sambis, who, who asks, um, what is, you know, what's the importance here of media production on the ground in Afghanistan by Afghan citizens? And, and why do other countries um, have a desire to fund them? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question too. Um, so I'll maybe start with the second part of the question. Why do other countries and nations have a desire to fund them? And I think it's partially through media that we see images and glimpse of other people. And so it forms our ideas and shapes our beliefs about different cultures and different nations. And so it's, it's a form of, of diplomacy. Some people call it soft power. Um, in its extreme cases, people call it media imperialism, if it's very dogmatic and censored. But in its more positive light, um, you know, I think it's really great to have access to media from other parts of the world. And so, uh, you know, most of the after 9-11, the UN set up what are called the Bonn Agreements, and it was a series of conferences in Bonn, Germany, where um, you know, over a hundred nations pledged donations to help Afghanistan, and many of them subsidized their own uh, media products and then dub it in the local languages so people can watch programming from all over the world. And some countries, like some of Afghanistan's bordering country, countries, especially in um, the former Soviet republics, there's a there's um, limits so that there, there can't be too much foreign programming because um, they believe that influence then creates too much influence on the local population, but not in Afghanistan. You can watch programs from all the bordering countries, from America, from Europe, from different places. And, and I think for the most part, that was, I argue in my book, a really positive development. And I would like to see more of that on on um, you know the cable channels we have here, but here in the U.S., there's um, also strict limitations. So the way that we could see it is more through streaming services. Uh, but yeah, this is something media studies scholars look closely at, and it, it tends to have uh, positive implications because we can learn so much more and have empathy towards people by being exposed to their media as opposed to just seeing them through uh, news clips and how they are represented in the news. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, you mentioned um, that, you know, folks on the ground there have a high expectation from their political talk shows and, and political satire and, and those types of genres. Um, you know, since the, the withdrawal in August, how has that shifted under um, Taliban control and, and what is the expectation now from people on the ground? Um, I imagine that that it's you had mentioned um, that you know many of these um, producers are kind of self censoring and um, fearful, and and so I'm curious to know how expectations have shifted um, within the um, media production um, in country. Yeah, yeah. 
another um, great question. So the first time around the Taliban um, were much more repressive in terms of the media environment. Um, and I was actually there as a young journalist just having graduated from undergrad. Um, and it was a terrible situation. You know, they banned almost every media except their own Sharia radio. So they only wanted um, their own very strict interpretation of Islam um, and on the radio on their own uh, radio station. But now I think they, they can't undo the fact that there has been this media proliferation as well as um, so many young people who've had exposure to having more rights and working um, you know, in a variety of different sectors. So people have been protesting. And the first time around, people did not protest. There was so much fear um, and they were so brutal um, in their response. But now people are, are trying to resist. And um, many of the media um, organizations are, are still functioning, but they are very cautiously proceeding. Um, and, you know, from my understanding is that they're in dialogue with, with different Taliban leaders about what's permissible and what's not and so forth. So we'll have to see. Um, so I think the expectations have changed in certain ways, but people are, are trying to still demand a level of media freedom that, that they became accustomed to in the last uh, 20 years. And, um, you know, do you, do you think that that, uh, demand and and perhaps kind of the um, less restrictive um, um, like oversight by the Taliban is more so because the Taliban is also interested in ensuring that their like external um, per, like the way that the rest of the world perceives them is is not like it was you know 20 plus years ago. Yeah, absolutely. I think that you know they've been they've been fighting um, an insurgent war against um, the Afghan National Army, NATO, U.S. forces for a long time, and now they're back in the position of being in government. And so governance is a very different thing. And um, they realized the last time around they were very isolated, and uh, you know very few countries recognized them officially. Um, and now, you know, countries are, are trying to figure that out. Do we recognize them? Do we not? Do we release this money that's allocated to Afghanistan to them? Or is that going to, you know, empower them more to do things that, that we don't want them to do, right? And so um, I think they're much more cognizant to your answer of, of trying to um, at least appear that um, they're allowing. So they, for example, they are allowing um, girls schools to remain open, unlike the first time around where many um, teachers had to start underground schools in their own homes and it was a dangerous situation. Um, and they are allowing women to go to Kabul University and other universities, but now it's gender segregated. And like I said, in a way they're much, they've been much more hospitable to international correspondents, particularly from the US and other European countries than they have been to, to local ones. But they haven't, you know, they have not made any kind of decrease to shut down all the media. Um, like the first time around, you know, they tried to destroy the National Film Archive of Afghanistan where um, and some, some people tried to protect that and hide it and they wouldn't let people have TV sets in their homes. Um, so they, you know, that's why people call them Taliban 2.0, but you know, nobody's really sure um, what the, they're, they're gonna be more um, you know, longer term going forward. And hopefully they won't be there longer term and that we can enable some kind of transitional government with them until you know there can be some kind of elections and you know maybe they could be a political party but not somebody an, a force that came uh, into power by force yeah absolutely um so we have a question that came in um from 
uh, Corey Stevanis. Many of the reports I've seen on Afghanistan have described the urban and rural areas as, complete, as almost completely different worlds. And you know, you alluded to this too earlier in your remarks, Wojma. Um, Corey asks, is this accurate? Um, and did the media do anything to bridge that cultural gap previously? Um, and, and I guess, you know, in follow up to that, um, what can be done moving forward also? Yeah, this, this is an important question also. And I think something that uh, people miss in their analysis of Afghanistan. Um, and, you know, like I said, I was born in Kabul and most of my research is in Kabul, but I also in the capital and in, in other urban areas, but I also travel to rural areas. And so I try to, um, you know, get different uh, areas represented and um, it's very different, you know, and, and the problem has always been this difference. And so um, I was part of the first wave of refugees during the Cold War once the Soviet invasion happened. And now many people are becoming refugees again over the last 20 years, but especially more recently. Um, but during the, the Soviet occupation and invasion, um, this was also a problem. So much of the resources were focused in urban areas and it was in the rural areas where people first started to fight back. Um, and the same thing has happened again. And um, most of the resources go to the urban areas and then people in the rural areas, as I said, kind of experienced the worst of both aspects of these interventions, both the military campaigns and the lack of um, distribution of development aid. Um, and it's something that people, and I, you know, I say this as somebody who, um, you know, is one of the uh, urban people, don't really consider them in the same um, category and don't really think of their situation. And now, you know, it has come back to um, haunt them. And I think this is something that we can also, uh, you know, think about is, is true to a certain extent in more developed countries like the US too, there's a big divide between people in rural areas and urban areas. And oftentimes we're in our own little bubbles. And then you're like, well, why is there so much resentment from people over there? It's because you don't have a sense of what they're experiencing. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's sometimes easier to kind of look at other places around the world and point the finger than seeing the problems in your own backyard. Um, so we have a couple questions here, um, more about the the recent drought um, from last year and you know the uh, kind of looming uh, food crisis. So um, Patrick Bagley asks, how dire is the food situation right now? What programs are planned to help? Um, and in follow up to that, um, you know, is there anything right now that, uh, you know, maybe some, some of the multilateral organizations around the world, uh, like for instance, the UN Food and Agricultural Organization um, or other governments, like how can they respond? And does this jeopardize um, you know, Afghan citizens' material survival versus, uh, you know, economic pressure leveraged against the Taliban? Yeah, so that's a, that's a big question. Maybe I'll, I'll just uh, say that the situation is, is really terrible there. And, um, you know, uh, many people, including myself, we focused, I'm, I'm in different organizations, humanitarian and activist organizations, we were focusing on, on trying to get people um, out of the country, um, but not everyone is able to get out. And so for many people who are unable to and don't have the resources or the connections to, um, you know, US, institutions and organizations, because they were the ones that were oftentimes given the special visas to come here, um, find themselves stuck there and probably will be there. And so I think um, it, there is a drought, there is inflation, um, you know, much worse than what we have here. Um, there's a food shortage crisis. So in a way, if, if there isn't a release of some kind of aid, um, you know, because there people have been crowdfunding and sending money to individuals, including myself, but 
that can only go so far. So if, if there isn't a, a, the UN and other groups don't step up, especially with winter coming and winter can be very cold over there, similar to here. Um, you know, we, you can see a humanitarian crisis in terms of, of people dying. There's already, you know, malnutrition. And, you know, this is particularly bad, once again, I, I would say, in, in rural areas, as well as with, um, with households that um, have more women or are headed by women, some ethnic minorities also, um, you know, have uh, in the past were uh, persecuted by the Taliban. So getting getting resources to those groups that are unable to work or lost their jobs due to the, the Taliban takeover or so forth um, is really important right now. Right. So, um, you know, I, I guess kind of coming off of that, um, as you mentioned, how it how it almost in some ways affects, you know, marginalized groups, especially women and girls, um, it, you know, what um, at this point, um, what do you do you think would be kind of the first steps to ensuring that that those populations um, do gain access, right? Um, is is it you know, communication through the Taliban um, to access like rural regions, um, or or are there other ways that that people around the world can help? Yeah, I mean, I think until we have some kind of uh, international commitment to resolving the situation, um, the only other options are what people are doing right now. So people are trying to get money. There's different organizations um, that are trying to, um, and I can you know post a list of them that are more um, trustworthy, are getting money into the hands of people. Uh, but that's also a, more of a Band-Aid situation. It's not really a longer term situation, um, you know, Post 9-11, as I said earlier in my talk, the UN and the U, what we call the US-led international coalition organized a series of meetings. Um, they drafted a constitution. They brought in a transitional, that was because I was supposed to be in power for two years until uh, you know, a more inclusive government and elections could be held. Um, and so there was there was there was much diplomatic efforts as opposed to um, you know just military efforts, but there's diplomatic efforts to um, improve the situation. I think something like that needs to happen again, and uh, you know figuring out how to release that money so that there's not a humanitarian crisis because there's there's you know activist and humanitarian organizations both globally and um, you know, on smaller scales that are trying to do really great work, um, but they can only do so much. Do you think that the, um, the representation of the US by Qatar will help at all? Um, I, I mean, I know that you know, the, the, um, in 2018, you know, that kind of the discussions that took place in Doha between uh, Qatar and uh, the Taliban in the US was kind of what led to the, this withdrawal. Um, is there hope there in, in the reestablishment of, of those negotiations? I mean, I would like to say yes, you know, great things have happened diplomatically. Um, I think the fact that the Taliban were able to take over by force so quickly and it wasn't just by force, it was also because many places um, had sustained so many casualties fighting them and were also, you know, um, just very displeased with the situation that they surrendered to them very easily. Um, that, you know, they might be less likely to negotiate. However, the fact that they are not recognized by most countries at this point, except very few, and that the fact that they don't have any money to run the uh, economy right now puts them in a situation where they, they, I think, would be very amicable. And there is this history, as you said, in Doha and Qatar of um, 
the Taliban negotiating before. Um, so we have one last question here um, before we end. Um, it says, when, when the withdrawal from Afghanistan first happened, we saw some misinformation in American media regarding the US's ability to safely and securely welcome Afghan migrants into American communities like Philadelphia, um, especially in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. What can we do as individuals to combat misinformation regarding Afghan migrants in America? And how can American citizens and communities who are skeptical of migrants for health and security reasons be convinced otherwise? Um, I mean, you know, once again, this is a big question. We have just a few minutes and, uh, you know, I think there's a entire, um, debates about about this um, you know how many how many migrants different countries are taking and is that the right number uh, but I, I mean on a personal level I was very heartened to see the response from Americans here they were very welcoming and I myself volunteered at the airport because as you know Philadelphia was one of two um, incoming, official incoming sites for the Afghan um, refugees. Um, and they, they were doing a really great job in terms of the, what I saw at the airport in terms of organizing medical screenings and quarantining people who had COVID um, and so forth. And, you know, the U.S. has, um, has accepted 135,000 Afghan refugees. Um, I mean, I think that's a big undertaking to now figure out how to resettle them um, and bring them into um, the economy and um, you know other sectors of society. Um, so we'll see, you know, what happens there. Um, but um, yeah, as I said before, it, there, you know, I think regardless of how many people we're able to accept here or in other countries, not everybody is going to be accepted. So we also have to focus on the people, the vast majority of Afghans who are going to be forced to, to stay there and live there on how to make their situations better. Thank you so much. So um, I, I know we're at time here um, and, and I really appreciate all of the time and perspective that you've shared with us this afternoon, Wajma. Um, we do encourage everyone uh, on this call to join us for other events like today's. Um, a, a few that I'd love to share with our audience today on December 6th, we're hosting a midday discussion about the importance of diplomacy with Ambassador David Hale, who joined the Foreign Service in 1984 and holds the rank of career ambassador. Um, there are options to participate either in person or via live stream, so we hope that you will consider joining us for that event. And then we close out our year on December 15th uh, when we invite folks to join us for the Council's Last Conversation Club of 2021. The Council Conversation Club, for those who don't know, allows for a facilitated small group discussion on a chosen topic. It's much like a book club where we provide participants with some light reading or listening material before coming to get together to discuss various points of view on the chosen topic. It's a fun way to engage with your peers and think about uh, you know, issues in the world around you in new ways. Uh, we'll be announcing some exciting new programming for 2022 in the coming weeks. And so if you'd like to register for these events that I've just mentioned or learn about others, please visit our website, wacphila.org, where you can also become a member to access special benefits and support the council's work. Um, for one final reminder before everybody departs, please do connect with us on social media um, and, and, you know, we appreciate everybody listening in today. Wajma, thanks again so much for joining us and, and for sharing your insights, your expertise, um, and we, we appreciate your time. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody.